。好的，接下来的话呢，我就呃介绍一下今天的嘉宾 Dammy。呃 ，Dammy 的话呢，他是有九年的美本申请的辅导的经验，呃，特别是特别擅长这个 STEM 方向的专业申请。虽然我呃。我是强调他擅长这个 STEM 方向的专业申请啊，但是他其实对这个商科以及这个 liberal arts 的学校的申请，甚至是包括这一个呃我们说的体育特招生，呃，在这些方面的话呢，他也是有非常呃非常多年的一个经验哈、啊，也是帮助了很多的学生。他辅导的学生中呢，有百分之七十是获得了全美 top 三十的学校的录取。此外的话呢 ，Dammy 他本身呢也是一个呃我们所说的别人家的孩子哈，他的本科呢是毕业于 U C Berkeley， 呃目前的话呢他是在呃芝加哥大学攻读他的历史系的博士学位，呃以及马上就要毕业了，所以他本身的话呢也是对这一个文科理科哈两边都非常的呃非常的有了解。好的，现在的话呢我就把时间交给我们的 Dammy， 呃在这里特别提一下哈，今天的讲座的话呢主要是以 Q A 的形式。是来进行，呃，所以我们的这个 presentation 的时间呢不会特别的长，呃，在这个 Dammy 的 presentation 的过程中呢，家长欢迎您把这个问题打到这一个 chat box 里面，呃，接下来的话呢，在 Q&A 的环节的话呢，我会逐个的把问题呃反馈给我们的 Dammy， 然后呢，他来进行答疑。好的，现在我就把时间交给 Dammy。So,、uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today.、Uh, my name is Dammy. I'm a college counselor. Uh, and I'll start with a brief introduction.、Uh, I think the the main goal of this presentation is to provide some general information about the summer,、uh, the stage that we're at, working with、uh, seniors,、uh, the stage that we're at, sometimes working with rising juniors, and then some general information about athletics and other questions that we've seen come up、uh, quite often. But the main goal of this presentation is to provide some time. For your questions, so if there are specific questions that you may have that are tailored to a specific student,、uh, or perhaps more focused questions about a specific major or something in particular that you may have, especially during this time that sometimes we call the summer scare, it's a time of panic.、Uh, sometimes seniors who are rising seniors are in the stage where they don't know if they're doing enough at this point.、Uh, they don't know if they should already have. All their supplements ready, and all their their、uh, common app essay ready, as well as their activity list and all of that. So this will provide sort of like a a breather and and some answers to to those questions. So、uh, without further ado, I will start. You know, speaking about my background first, just so you know who's talking and and where I'm coming from. So、uh, like I said, I'm a college consultant, college counselor. I've been doing this. For nine cycles, this will be my tenth cycle,、uh, and I predominantly have been working with、uh, what we deem elite students, so students interested in getting into maybe top thirties of the U.S. news ranking or top twenties of their specific field of study as well.、Uh, I work predominantly with international students or national students whose background is East Asian, South Korean, and Chinese students tend to be my largest pool of students, and so that's the work that I've been doing for the past、um, nine years or so.、Um, I worked physically in South Korea for about three years, and then moved to、uh, Chicago, where I worked remotely、uh, for the past. Six years or so. Now I'm in the West Coast, but I continue to do the work、uh, remotely.、Um, all right, let's move on to the second cycle. So,、uh, a little bit about who I am. That you know, it's it's somewhat unusual for a college counselor that deals with questions that aren't field specific to have a PhD, to be a scholar in a sense, and have done the the steps for academia. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about why that's a benefit. Uh, to have a college counselor that is in academia, that is, you know, involved in in university life, and I think the the major the major benefit is that、uh, as a consultant, it's important to be aware of the academic situation. So not only do I attend NACAC and all these different uh, um, events that we have for college counseling, but I'm also aware of what's going on in universities. I do research something. I mean. Two years ago, I spent a summer doing research at Harvard,、uh, and then another one I went to、uh, Columbia. So there, 
I am involved with the universities. I get to learn and see the majors. I get to talk to doctoral students, undergraduates. So I am a part of that community. And I think that gives me a little bit of an edge in understanding more or less the trends and currents uh, uh, with admissions officers. It so happens also that I become you know, close friends with a former and uh, current admissions officers. And so that adds a lot of value to, to the work. But what I think it's most important is that as an academic, uh, you get to do a lot of the work that students are doing in their applications. Someone who was an admissions officer, somebody who worked in admissions may know uh, what it is that is necessary to have to get into a good school, but they might not necessarily know how to produce it. It's sort of like, you know, a, a person who, who goes wine tasting, they might be experts in wine, but they might not know how to make it. And I think one of the, the major differences is that uh, if you've been there, if you do the research and the writing and you're a writer predominantly and you work with students uh, in uh, uh, essay writing and all these different things, you get the skills to you know, know what the, taste, the, the wine should taste like, but also know how to produce it. And I think that's what makes a, a big difference uh, uh, coming from, from my background. So that's just a quick, you know, uh, to situate, contextualize who I am, uh, a little bit of bragging, sorry about that. And uh, yeah, so before, before we move forward, I think one of the things that I wanna mention, and it, it's a question that we have uh, quite a lot, that I get quite a lot from students is, am I too late? What am I doing? If I wanna apply early decision, early action, restrictive early action, what should I be doing now? Should I have everything ready? Should I be sending you know, my materials as soon as possible? Where should I be at? Uh, it's a difficult question because it really depends on many factors. The main factor is when does your semester start or your quarter? Uh, for a student, for example, who's starting school August 8th, you're not super early. If you don't have a Common App essay, if you don't uh, have even brainstorming for it, if there's no account being made for the Common App, if you know we're in that very early stages, then it's not an ideal stage to be at because uh, once the semester start, and I'm sure you've taken all the most rigorous course load that you could take, it's gonna get busy. And so making sure that you do everything well as, as alongside all your academic work can be pretty frustrating and difficult. So for those students, they're a little late. Uh, for students who will start in September at some point, those are not so late, but also not early. So ideally, uh, the, the process starts a little bit behind. But since we get this question of the of you know early, I'm applying early. Why, where should I be? What should I be doing? So I just want to you know add a little bit of information about what that even means. So what early decision is is generally early decisions are going to be uh, applications that instead of submitting them in January, you would be submitting them in November, so it's much earlier, right? November 1st, November 15th, depending on the schools, that's the early round. And so students get very frustrated and anxious about that uh, deadline, but what does early decision mean? Why would anyone do it? Uh, and the reality is a little nebulous. So we don't know uh, for many schools, what are the big benefits of early decision? For some of the top schools, uh, it, it tends to be sort of like a question of whether, whether it is you're getting an admissions boost or not. And those are the type of questions that we get very often. So I'll speak a little bit about first what early decision means. It just means that it's a, it's a binding contract between student applicant and the university that if you get accepted into their university, you should not consider any other acceptances in fact, they tell you to withdraw all your applications from any other schools that you've applied to and you're going to that school. So it's a commitment in which you bind yourself to a certain university. Uh, and, and for those reasons, it's a difficult decision to make. For some students, that means, well, I'm not gonna get any freedom in choosing schools. Uh, why would I do that? And the reality is, well, for some students, it doesn't make sense to do it. Uh, if you're a student who has many options and you are applying to many different programs, maybe you're applying to some business schools and some economics programs and uh, you have so many options, you really like Stern, but you also really like Dartmouth and you also really like Notre Dame and you might have a lot of things that you like and you are not set on what to do at this moment, then maybe early binding decision is not a great idea for you. When is a good idea to do it? Well, sometimes 
when you want to apply to a far reach and maybe try to get a little bit of a boost, my suggestion is talk to me or your college counselor or your college consultant to see whether a school will give you a boost. Like if you tell me, well, I'm really thinking of uh, doing REA, early restrictive action for Harvard. I will get a huge boost. The reality is you won't. There isn't a big boost for, for Harvard students applying or restrictive early action. Uh, but if somebody tells me, well, I'm gonna ED uh, Vanderbilt, well, you will get some boost. And so at least percentage wise, uh, percentage wise, I think uh, Vanderbilt is almost close uh, to doubling your chances or your percentage of, of acceptance. Uh, from from regular decision to early decision. So that's one of the reasons to do it. If you're applying to a far reach or a reach school that you really like and you want to improve your chances, that's a, a good way to do it. Um, another reason to do it is because, well, you're absolutely in love with that school. And that's great. I mean, some students, uh, it's a little risky. I, I, I wouldn't recommend anyone to be fixated with a school because sometimes that's recipe for breaking hearts of people. Don't do that. Don't get fixated on a school. Keep an open mind. But if you do have a school that you really, really like, uh, then that's a good school to, to ED for. I mean, it's a commitment. Like, I'm willing to show this school that if they consider me, there's no one else I would consider. The other great benefit is that, I mean, the great advantage that you get is you get to know early. By December, you already know if you're in or out of the school. And then while other students are stressing about it, you are fine. Uh, and then the other reason why uh, um, students do it is because uh, sometimes for scholarships and things of that nature, you get a bit of a benefit. So you might be considered for more merit-based scholarships, you might be considered for different programs, uh, honors programs, uh, things of that nature. And that's one of the, the good reasons why people uh, do early decision. There's early action as well. Early action is a non-binding early uh, application. Uh, and so what that means is the same idea, you apply early, you apply also November 1st or November 15, depending on the school, and then you get to know whether you got in or not in December as well. The big difference is that this is not binding. So, uh, and as you might suspect, you also don't get a boost almost at all uh, for almost any school. So generally the reason why you would do EA is to get to know early where you are, where you stand. It's a good way to know that, do my applications need more work? Am I doing the right things? Am I being considered? And also for the consideration for scholarships. Uh, so you get all of those things from, from early action. One thing to know about, you cannot early decision Northwestern and decide to do early action uh, uh, Ivy League schools. That's not possible because early decision is binding. They don't allow you to do EA with other private schools. You can still EA some uh, uh, public universities. You could EA, for example, um, UIUC and Purdue while also EDing Northwestern. That is completely valid. That's because it's it's a different system. Those are the public school system doesn't interfere with the um, with the private schools. It's a little bit complicated, but we can talk more in detail about that specifically if you want to know about like when can I EA for some schools and ED when I'm EDing for some and all that. Uh, that's a little bit more specific. Uh, in general, uh, I get the question: Do you recommend applying early? And I think it's it's case by case. Uh, for in my opinion, it, it's I have I've met many counselors who say no, 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 early decision is just a waste of time. Uh, in my opinion, it's really useful for many students and not only because um, of boost and all of that, I think one of the main reasons why it's useful, it's because it prepares students pretty well early on. Like if you get ready, like if you think, okay, well, I can submit everything by January, then I don't need to have a structure and I can just finish everything in December. That's recipe for panic, anxiety, and in a really bad time. So uh, I think what, what early decision does really well is it allows students to structure their timeline a little bit better so that they can accomplish things, have some uh, um, stepping stones and moving in, in a sort of like gradual manner to being ready uh, for, for their application. So uh, that's one of the, the reasons why I, I really like for a student to at least have like one EA school, even if they're not doing early decision anything. It's like, okay, we'll throw in then one EA school so that we will be able to structure your timeline a little bit more efficiently. Um, right, so uh, the college application timeline, like I said, 
if, if students that are starting now, depending on where they are, when, when their summer is going to start, it can be a little bit late. It can be a little bit early. I mean, not too late. Nobody's early at this point. That's, that's the reality. But it, you can be not super late or, or, or kind of late. Uh, and so what do you want to do for your summer, which is now coming to an end? But generally, what you want to do uh, with your summer is to make sure that you have a college list that is pretty pretty solid. Uh, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, college lists don't get finalized sometimes until it's application day and things are changing or something like that. But it's really good to have a set, you know, 10 to 15 schools that are solid gold. And you think, okay, these are my 10 to 15 schools that I will apply. Again, there can be changes, especially if there's like a, a radical change with an SAT. Let's say you had you know, 1450 and all of a sudden you're at a 1580, that's gonna, that's gonna be a significant change in, in your college list. You can get a little bit more ambitious, you can do a little bit more. So you can keep, these are not written in stone, but it's great to have a college list that is solid, that is well, you know, strategized, that is well balanced, that has a nice level of uh, reach schools, uh, uh, matches, safeties. My general recipe is seven reach schools, five match schools, three safeties uh, as a main list. Sometimes it is a good idea, depending on the student, how much they're doing, how, how ahead they are, to have a bench of maybe five schools that can be reach and match and safety, whatever you want. It, generally, they tend to be reach uh, so that, you know, when, once you finish your list of 15 schools, you can tackle those other five. Um, in the summer, it's also a good time to do a lot of college visits. Uh, I recommend starting college visits sometimes during the spring of junior year if you have time. Uh, but during the summer, it's a great time also to tour some of the schools. Uh, especially the ones that you have a lot of interest in. Uh, try to have a diverse, you know, pool of schools that you're visiting, match schools, reach schools, and even some safeties, why not? Uh, and I think the reason why you want to have a diverse pool of uh, schools that you're um, uh, visiting, because sometimes that's the place, well, there are two real reasons. One is about fit, and the second one is about strategy. So the one about fit is once you're in a campus, you get to get a feeling of whether this place looks like a place that you're going to like. I've had students who, um, I had a, a computer science students who really didn't want to go to Seattle. Uh, they didn't want to apply to University of, 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 of UW Seattle. They thought, no, I really don't like rain. I don't like gloomy weather. I don't think I'm going to, it's, it's just not for me. Uh, and then the student went on a visit and, 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 and the student was like, this place is amazing. The campus is beautiful. The people are amazing. I really want to apply. So visiting those campuses can really make a difference in, in, on the list. The complete opposite can be true as well. Like I've had students who, uh, you know, they, they were really enthusiastic about uh, MIT. Uh, and then they went to the campus and they were like, you know what? I, I feel like I didn't connect with people. I don't know if... And then I went to Caltech and it was very small and, and I felt like I was part of a, a little community and I really loved that. And so you can make decisions in terms of, of college lists based on that. Uh, I think I've seen many students become from not really liking liberal arts colleges to being big fans of uh, liberal arts colleges. I've seen students uh, who were absolutely obsessed with schools like uh, NYU to being like, I don't know if I want an experience of the big city well, there's no like physical boundaries for the campus. So there are so many layers to this. And that's why college visits are a really great place to go for fit, making sure that, you know, the place fit, fits right, that the students that you talk to feel right, that the admissions officers feel right. It's a great thing to do. I recommend doing that not during the senior year, but rather summer and the, uh, uh, um, the spring semester of junior year. It's, it's a great way to get a sense of what that list is gonna look like and not while you're super busy during uh, your senior year. Um, so so that it, it's very important to do that for, for fit, but also for strategy. What do I mean by that? Um, the important thing about strategy with college visits is that sometimes successful supplemental essays make reference to those visits. If you've been at a particular library, at a particular lab, you've talked to a, a specific uh, uh, doctoral student or you talk to this professor, those things can often be used as leverage, as ammunition to, you know, add to your application. When you're writing an essay about a place and you say, well, I've been there. I've, I've, I've felt what it feels like to be at, uh, at the library, at the school. I felt like I fit in really well. Those things can often be 
a nice way for the universities and the admissions officers to know, okay, well, this student knows they really like this school. It's not going to be a gamble. It really sounds like they really care about this school and they really like it. And it's it's a good way to, you know, for the for admissions officers to feel like there's a there's a real connection. It's not like they, they just browse the, the website and oh, it looks great. They asked a good school ranking, let's apply to it. Uh, so it feels more personal. Those things are very important in summer, but perhaps even more important, not that the college list, but almost the, the, uh, as important as everything else is that making sure that you start essays. Uh, I know sometimes I get a lot of students tell me, but essays are not released until August 1st or late July. So I don't know what the supplements are gonna be like. Well, we, we can suspect that the Common App personal statement is gonna stay pretty, you know, the same. It's not going to change too much. And if it does, you always have the last option of like writing whatever you want. In reality, sometimes I suggest students don't even think about the problem when you write the common app personal statement. It should be just about yourself. And then you fit in, you feel where you're going to, uh, um, you can connect it to a specific problem later on as you're writing. So for that essay, there's no excuse. You can definitely start early. You can absolutely start brainstorming, find a topic, develop it, create drafts and hopefully have almost a pre-finalized version for, for it by, before you start your semester. Once you have your semester uh, starting and you already have a pre-finalized uh, common app statement, then it's much easier to revisit, you know, like when you do a great painting and you leave it there and you come every two days to see if there are any changes that need to be made. I think that's the process that you should be following for a, a common app personal statement. Uh, you should have something done quite early and then you revisit it to see, Hmm, is this fitting my overall narrative? Is this the common thread or theme that I have here really informing the overall uh, picture that I wanna paint as an applicant? And I think that that really, really helps in the process. Um, the final thing, I mean, and that's, that's a good thing to do with a common app statement. And I do wanna add, if you are pretty proactive and you're working really hard, you can also start working on a couple of supplemental essays. Uh, some will change, some will not. And so it is a pretty good idea to, you know, start answering maybe the ones that you plan on applying early decision. Maybe look at those UC essays that they're likely not going to change much and start looking about your work going to answer, brainstorm, maybe have some drafts. It's never a waste of time. You're going to use those essays whether or not they remain the same. As we learned this year, uh, when, when uh, the college, the the supplemental essays, the prompts were released. There weren't any huge changes almost for any school. And so you, you do get to use pretty much what you, you already created over the summer when you're applying. So uh, it's no excuse not to stutter. Um, I, I've heard that excuse so often from students. No, the essays have not been released. That's not a big deal. If you have the time, if you have the energy, you should really invest uh, on doing that. Uh, so the other thing is, making sure you're you know, doing the last hump, the last extra effort on that signature internship, that very special internship that you have, that it's sort of like an X factor in your application. Maybe that cornerstone project that you have, the little company that you're developing, the little app that uh, you're working on, uh, all these different things that you have as your own personal projects that matter a lot and that are sort of like the, um, the crown jewel of your application, uh, I think those those things should be really, really uh, 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 nurture a lot. You work, you should work on that a lot uh, to make sure that you're showing that extra effort on your on your main project uh, on on the later stage of your um, your junior year. And then you should carry on with that work again during your senior year so to show that you're still committed to that specific specific cornerstone project. Uh, or passion project. Sometimes it's it's any project that you have that is yours and, and you're really connected to. Um, so uh, another thing that I want to mention about about um, the summer, it's it's a good time to uh, make sure that you're thinking very strategically about the courses that you've selected, making sure that if there are any changes that need to be made, you can make it on, on time. You know, talk to your counselor, talk to your to your college uh, uh, consultant about. Okay, well, I chose this courses. Does this really show the rigor that I want to show? Uh, 
think if you haven't, I mean, ideally this happens in, in, in the uh, last semester of junior year is that you choose more or less who you're gonna uh, ask for letters of recommendation. And, and for the, pre the whole previous year, you've been working on that being very diplomatic and, and being nice to your counselor and teachers. Uh, but if, if that wasn't the case, it's no big deal. I think what we can, what you can do is uh, sort of like focus on making sure that you're thinking strategically about, okay, who am I gonna ask for for uh, college um, app, uh, recommendation letters and why? Um, so you can do that over the summer. So during September of, of senior year, when the semester has started for almost everyone, uh, the main thing is making sure that you're taking the right steps for uh, the college admission strategy, making sure that you have the uh, everything ready for financial aid, uh, FAFSA, if you have a student who's applying for FAFSA, and I think almost everyone who's eligible for it, or even if you're not gonna qualify for it, people should apply for FAFSA because uh, merit-based scholarships also use it. So everybody, October 1st, everybody should have their FAFSAs ready and applying for FAFSA uh, as soon as possible. Uh, it's important to have it. It is important for scholarships and things of that nature, even if they're not need-based, even if they're merit-based, they look at FAFSA anyway. That's why it's important to, Think about those things and do it. Uh, letters of recommendation, as I mentioned, this is the time to ask your recommenders if you haven't done so already. Think strategically, strategically about who you're asking. Generally, you want a teacher who was your teacher during sophomore year, a teacher who knows you really well, a teacher who's able to contribute to your overall narrative, a teacher that you trust and you know that they're willing to put in the effort to write a unique letter for you not someone who's gonna have a template and just copy and paste it. You should really be strategic about who you choose. The main thing you should do is make sure that the it's, it's sort of like a, a teacher from a core class that knows you really well and that has um, the willingness to write well about you. Make sure they like you. I think the, the, the to put it bluntly, if they don't like you, they're not gonna write a good letter. Make sure that they like you and you should know that they like you. Um, yeah, so, this is a great time to, or the right time to, to work a lot on your essays. Uh, ideally, again, like I said, at this point, students should already have a pre-finalized common app statement or very late stage common app statement, personal statement, uh, maybe a couple schools or more with supplemental essays. But this is a good time to invest in that and working on all of the other supplemental essays, especially if you're applying early decision, make sure you're tackling those first. If you're not applying early decision or after you finish those, then you should be working on UCs. If you're applying for UCs, just go with whatever the deadlines come first. So uh, early decision, again, November 1st, 15, and then you have uh, November 30th for um, UCs. So thinking a lot about that, making sure that your grades are on point, especially the first semester, you still need A's, you still need to have uh, those A's to back up your entire GPA. Uh, and also you have to make sure that you're taking a rigorous course load. So making sure that you're taking the most difficult class that you can possibly take that also contribute to your narrative. Uh, so all of those things, extremely important. Uh, make sure that you are close to your, if your school has a college counselor, make sure that that's a person who's an ally and not someone who's a stranger because college counselors write for a letter of recommendation you should know them. Uh, if you don't have a college counselor, then that would be your academic counselor, your normal counselor. That would be the person who's going to write those things. So being diplomatic and making sure that you have good relationships with them is really important. Uh, in 12th grade, that's important, but it's also very important in 11th grade. So make sure that you're cultivating those relationships as soon as you can. Um, October, if it's necessary to retake the SAT or the ACT or any or any uh, test, then it, it's it's a good time to do so. Uh, making sure that the portfolios are ready. Uh, if there's a art portfolio that's necessary, the general application. Uh, making sure that you have all the your that you pay close attention to your activity list on the Common App, uh, your activity list on the uh, um, the UC apps, and that you're working actively to make sure that you have all the essays and elements ready for early decision, early action in UCs. Uh, so this is a time, of course, to make sure that everything is ready for our ED, REA, EA schools, uh, because you have to be ready for uh, submission. Generally, I like for students to be done with the entire thing by maybe October 20th, and then we spend the next 10 days or sometimes two weeks or three weeks 
making sure that everything is in perfect uh, conditions for them to be submitted November 1st, November 15th. So depending on the, on, on the deadline. So that's really, really important. Um, November, finalize and submit uh, UC applications. Again, same process, uh, making sure that you really revisit those UC application essays that you probably worked on before, making sure that they're still uh, uh, of great quality, making sure that they still represent what you wanna say uh, with your narrative and, and making sure that those as, uh, are strong. That's very important. Um, complete applications for college specific scholarships that you might be eligible for, that's important as well. Uh, there are sometimes some of those that students are not aware of and you can apply for. It's a good time to think about them, especially if you have a lot of time in your hands, if you've been proactive and you applied for a lot of things already, uh, you have all of your essays ready or the vast majority of your essays ready, then you can start looking for scholarships to apply to that you're gonna be eligible for. Uh, and, and, and that's a great way to spend that time. Uh, December should be sort of like a time in which you finalize your regular decision. This is a time where, you know, if you're starting essays in December, it's okay if it's like your last college or your last two colleges and you're still, you're gonna use a lot of the material that you've used before and these are your safety schools, that's normally fine. But in December, you should be already quite advanced. Uh, you should be pretty, you know, have very strong supplemental essays for the vast majority of your schools. Maybe you're touching on your uh, uh, bench, adding, adding schools from your bench. Uh, but by ge generally like by the first week of December, I like my students to have uh, maybe December 10th to have everything done. And then the next weeks are very strange weeks. The reason why I say that is because we have winter break, sometimes there's Christmas celebrations, there's all these stuff going on and it's a really messy time. So I really recommend students to be pretty much done before all of that mess. And then once they're done with that, they can use that time for well, while they're having you know their Christmas celebrations or doing whatever they're doing, uh, they can go back and look at their common app and reread it real quick and say, yeah, this is amazing. I love my essays. Or say, hmm, I'm thinking about this sentence right here. Let me message Sammy and see what he thinks about this particular essay, I, uh, this particular uh, sentence right here. And then we can work on those little things, but not, you know, let's craft an entire new application. It's too late for that. It's, it's a problem uh, for students that are doing that. And so it, it's a great time to just make final decisions, make sure everything's ready, and then uh, that you're ready to make to hit that submit button in January, uh, early January when when you have all that. So this is when you you know send in applications, uh, you do interviews sometimes for for schools that uh, offer that. Uh, again, sometimes with interviews, sometimes they come earlier, sometimes they come later. It depends on when you you're sent an invitation to do it. As soon as you get an invitation to be invited uh, interviewed, you should take it uh, for any school. So. Uh, with my students, I work closely with that. As soon as they get an, an invitation to be uh, interviewed, if you take the invitation quite fast and then you show a lot of commitment to it, it, it speaks well uh, of you. And also the, the interviewers are not as busy, might not be as grumpy or moody. And, and so, you know, jump to those uh, interviews as soon as you can. I prepare my students and then they, they go on and, and generally do pretty well with their interviews. Uh, from January to March is mostly, uh, one of the most painful times really waiting. Uh, and there's a lot of waiting. And uh, so uh, there's really not much to do. Sometimes things that, that, that can be done if there's an update or something that has changed that is major. Uh, if you won an amazing award, if, you, if your company all of a sudden became a, 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 you know, a multi-million dollar company, I don't know, like any big thing that happens, uh, there's always soft networking emails that can be sent to admissions officers and say, hey, you know what, I have a quick update. It might be too late, it might not be, but it's a good, it shows good initiative to say, you know what, I have this app that I developed and right now it has five stars and, and, and Google Play or whatever and everybody's buying it and I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's making an impact. I really wanted to you know, update you on that. That's where I am. Or if you you got published for a major publication, anything that you did that it, the, that is a big deal, you can always send some kind of an um, update in during this time. Sometimes again, the decisions have been made already. Sometimes you're going to be ignored. Sometimes you're going to be acknowledged. Uh, it never hurts. So it those emails sometimes help. Sometimes they don't. Uh, so generally, what's going to happen here is um, you're going to get 
decisions um, and then make a decision uh, by the end of April, decision day, May 1st. Uh, and so generally this is a good time to search for additional scholarships, search for additional programs. Sometimes you have, they have you know, a special bridge program if you wanna go over the summer to look at the school again uh, or do different things. Or those are things that you can do, but generally this is a time of making decisions. It's a decision-making time uh, and applying for, for, for additional scholarships. Um, yeah, and so uh, if you're waitlisted, this is a good time, of course, to work on your waitlist. Uh, with my students who that I work with, I will help with uh, letters of reconsideration. I will help with the updates. I will help with you know everything that um, that the whole process of the waitlist entails. I'll be helping that. Uh, uh, um, with, with with most of my students who were waitlisted and who want to get out of the waitlist. I mean, sometimes you, I have students who got waitlisted from a school, but they have already been accepted at a school that they prefer, they just withdraw. Uh, in fact, if you want to be kind, you withdraw, so you leave the room for someone else for in, on the waitlist. Uh, and so, yeah, so this is a time to, you know, work on those letters of reconsideration, uh, work on, 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 on making sure that you are reconsidered um, uh, for for your application, if you've been waitlisted, summon orientation sessions and all that. I mentioned that already. Okay, so that that's the case for uh, seniors for eleventh graders. It's never too early to start. I think a fall during the fall there isn't too much to do. I think the main work for students in the fall is to, of course, keep up with their grades, do all the work. But it's a good time to start exploring. It's maybe you can visit a, a college that is close to you. Maybe you can, if you have a chance and you're visiting the Bay Area because family lived there, but you are from Boston. Uh, well, why not go to Stanford? Why not go to Ber Berkeley? Why not you visit Santa Clara? I don't know, the schools that are around there, it's a good time to visit. It's a good time to explore and think about majors and fields of interest, though you should be doing that earlier. And I, if, if, for the students who work with me from uh, you know, freshman year and all of that, sometimes we start strategizing uh, earlier than, than, than uh, junior year, but uh, it's, it's a good time if you haven't done so already, think about, okay, what do I really wanna study? And what are my options? And what are the schools that best fit that? Make sure that you're taking the PSAT in October and making sure that you're uh, you know, qualify for for uh, National Merit Scholarship Awards and things of that nature. Taking APs, taking uh, APs, the most rigorous level of coursework that you, you, that you can, that's a thing that you should be doing since ninth grade, but specifically during uh, junior year, it's really important to show uh, that you're taking, you know, if, if you're in one of those schools that don't allow to take any APs or in freshman year, maybe one in sophomore year, and then you can take six if you want to in junior year, then make sure that you're choosing, making those right decisions. Which APs am I taking? How many of them am I taking? Can I handle them? I mean, the main thing, the main thing for students that I always have to put emphasis on that, if you're taking six APs and another three APs outside of school and you're taking all these different APs because you want to be impressive, but you're getting Bs in them, bad decision. So the most important thing is your GPA. The second most important thing is the rigor of the courses that you're choosing. So if you're if your APs, an additional AP is gonna sacrifice your GPA a little bit, not a great move. But make sure that you're choosing you know, schools that will show that you're competent academically, that you're able to maintain a very high GPA, ideally a 4.0, just A's, A's are great. Uh, and then taking as many uh, uh, APs as you can. Um, uh, that will reflect that. Making sure if you're a STEM oriented student, make sure that you're taking all those uh, STEM oriented courses. You know, you want your chemistry, you want your bio, you want your physics, you want your calc. So making sure that you are aware of what you're taking and why. You also wanna make sure that you're well rounded. So take that a push, don't skip it. It's gonna help you. And, and so there, there are these different things that you have to talk directly with your um, counselor, with, with your consultant as well uh, uh, in making those decisions, but that's very important. Uh, so prepare for SAT and ACT. Those things are really important, uh, should be taking uh, in the spring, making sure that you're doing well on those as well. Some uh, spring, in spring you create your first college list. Uh, this college list is a much more exploratory college list, generally of around 20 to 30, 
20 to 25 colleges that you identify as colleges that you like and that you're interested in. Sometimes these colleges may look like, well, rank one to rank 25 of the, uh, uh, of the rankings. It's very natural for students to do that. Don't do that. Try to be aware of the fields of study that you're interested in. See which schools make the most sense for you. Not all of the top 25s are amazing for students interested in computer science. In fact, many of them are not. Uh, so make sure that you're making the right decisions in terms of field of study, things that you're interested in, and, and what represents a good school, what represents a good reach school, a match school, a safety school. So make sure those first, even that first very exploratory uh, college list represents some deep thinking and some strategy. Um, again, continue working on SAT, SATs, that's pretty standard. Um, and the great thing to do here, uh, again, this should start earlier, but this is a good time to make sure that you're establishing those connections with your teachers, uh, your guidance counselors, whether they are college counselors or um, uh, academic counselors or whatever they may be. Whoever's writing your letters of recommendation, make sure that you have a good relationship with them. Make sure that you're diplomatic, make sure that they like you, make sure that they're invested in you. And so that you can make an informed decision when you ask people to write your letters of recommendation. The counselor, you have no option. The counselor will write your letter of recommendation. So you have to be especially careful um, how to approach counselors. Make sure that they feel respected, heard. Uh, make sure that you ask them for help and guidance and that you show that you're willing to put in the work to get into a college and into a great college and that they like you. I think that's really, really important. Uh, making sure that you have a, a, you know, a pretty good plan for what the summer is going to look like. If you have to send in those applications for, you know, Bank of America leadership or any, any top program that you want to be a part of over the summer, make sure you're doing that. If you're going to be engaging in research, make sure you're sending those uh, BU RISE applications and make sure that if it's something that's a little bit more specific to you, that you have your cornerstone project where you're going to be maybe using your, your technology to fight sargasm in, in the Caribbean, then maybe you are already making plans to make that trip and that you're working with NGOs there and with maybe with the local government. All of these things have to be really thought about and planned uh, during the spring or before of junior year. So it, it's a great time. It's great to be proactive. Rising, June, rising senior summer should be one that's very well planned and one that's you're not just, okay, well, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to work on my essays. It's great to work on your essays, but you have to make sure that you're doing something that shows that extra little push, that little time where you can show, okay, well, I did something grand. I went to to the Caribbean and I fought the sargasm with my new technology that uh, disintegrates sargasm, you know, that, or that, oh, okay, I'm ready for, for the BU RISE and I'm doing very nice research uh, with this institution. You know, these different uh, um, programs that you can be a part of, or even if it's individual, as I said, you have to make sure that you're planning ahead of time, making sure that you're, you're ready for it and you just, because the summer doesn't start and you're like, okay, what do I do now? Uh, it's a really bad thing to happen. And it happens quite often. Um, and so it, it's really nice. It's really nice of you if you get ready ahead of time. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about because we get a lot of questions about uh, uh, athletic recruitment and things of that nature. Uh, so athletic recruitment, is, it's, it's, it's really tricky and it really depends on a lot of factors. If you have a student who's clearly, if you're a student who's clearly potentially a division one candidate. Uh, if you have, you know, all the elements to be a division one candidate, then that should be a, a strong focus. That means that you should be, you know, contacting coaches right ahead. Maybe your own coaches making connections for you. Uh, you're getting uh, scouted and recruited. That's really, really important for division one. And so division one is sort of like that very special place um, uh, for students who are clearly going to get into division one. I think the, the two most important ones to think about is division one and division three. Division three is an interesting one because for the vast majority of students that who will want to think about recruitment and they are thinking of it strategically, they're going to be division three students, the ones who have potentially the potential to be recruited, but they aren't necessarily, you know, the top tennis player in the nation. Uh, I think for those students, it's really tricky because you have to play both games. 
you have to be very active with your own coach and making sure like, hey, coach, if if you want, is it possible that you send, you know, uh, uh, some letter to these universities so that we can be connected? If the, sometimes the, the coaches will say, no, I don't have time for that or I can't do that, then you can also cold email uh, coaches from different universities that are division three uh, and, and start to, you know, get, get seen early. Maybe start sending those uh, emails with some video footage of you when you're a, a junior early on in your junior year. Uh, so make sure that you're being seen, make sure that you they know your name. That's really important for division three um, aspiring students. But what's really important there is that you don't do that while sacrificing your academics. For division three students, Specifically, you really want to make sure that you're following everything else that I said for, for students who are in a normal application cycle. You're still doing all of that. What's really important is to make sure that you're bugging the coaches quite early on, that you're being like that you're being seen, you're being regarded, you're being understood. Sometimes you're going to be ignored. That's fine. It's not going to hurt you. Send those emails, make sure that you're being looked at. You're going to be rejected a lot of times. They might tell you, oh, our school doesn't really recruit students. Uh, we can just waive your, we can just flag your application if you're good enough, but we'll see. That's fine. All of that, it's fine. Just make sure that you're sending enough uh, material. That's pretty important. Um, here's some general tables of, of, uh, of especially the sweet spot uh, for, um, what you see here is the World Academic Rank. Uh, normally, what you want to be looking at is the, the U.S. News Rankings, but this is just to give you an idea of, of, of uh, what things look like. For Division Three, there are very a few schools. Uh, for many sports, there are Division Three, and the main ones that students are going to be, you know, very interested in being recruited for are those Division Three students who are also very capable academically, and that they want to sort of like some leverage in their application, and that they they want to play the sport, but also they're good enough academically or close to. Uh, so you're going to get your University of Chicago, Johns Hopkins, Emory. Generally, they get a ton of emails from students because those are division three, generally division three schools that are gonna be uh, very attractive for students who are in that position, which means coaches get flooded with emails in the summer. They get absolutely flooded with those emails. And I've talked to those coaches and they say, you have no idea how many students who wanna play squash at the University of Chicago, who wanna play tennis at the University of Chicago, send me emails saying, hey, here's my, all my stuff, blah, 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 division three, blah. and it's overwhelming and they can't look at them. That's why it's really important to establish, especially if you're gonna be applying or you wanna be recruited or you wanna go through the process for any of those top schools that are division three, MIT, uh, U Chicago, Johns Hopkins, it's really important to start early, make sure that they know you early because it's it's the most, it's somehow super competitive to get those positions because there are those students who are in between academic and, 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 and sports and all of that. So those tend to be incredibly competitive. Uh, and so be aware of that. You have to be aware of that when, when you're an applicant and you say, well, yeah, U Chicago is great because it's a top school with a division three program. If I get recruited, yay. Well, that same thought, thousands of students are having it. And so, uh, so um, you should be aware of that and you should be proactive uh, with, with the way you move with that. The best way to do it is if your coach, if you're your own coach or maybe an independent coach knows you and knows the coaches and they can introduce you to them. That's generally the best way to get introduced to a coach and start to be seen and heard. Uh, but if there's no way of doing it, I've had a lot of students who just send their, you know, their, their detailed email with their videos, with their rankings, with everything else uh, to coaches. And sometimes coaches will say, hey, you know what? You are interesting. You are, you are a good candidate. Tell me more about yourself and maybe come and see the school. I don't know. Sometimes it depends. So um, it's good to start early. Um, Okay, well, these are some of the things that I, I've um, um, that I've talked about. Uh, you have to be registered in NCAA, of course, and uh, participate in, in camps or anything that they have during the summer or before the summer. Anything else that you can do to be seen and be heard, it's really, really important to do it as early as you can. Uh, so a little bit about my philosophy, just to finish here with, with this general information. Uh, I think of myself as a very, you know, 
I'm, I'm the type of counselor that molds and adapts to the needs of the students. But in general, I, I'm, I'm a very personalized uh, uh, um, consultant, which works very hands-on and hands with, your, with, with the student. Uh, and so I work very closely with students, especially in the process of uh, the personal statement. I think the personal statement is most successful when the student is able to show those very personal elements of who they are, those very unique parts of who they are. And so I like to work very you know, closely with students to make sure that they are, that I know them well enough to ask them questions that might be very personal, that we can you know, work together to make sure that they're sending the right message. And the only way for that to work is to really get to know the students. So I really like to know uh, the students and really work with them, making sure that I'm looking not, you know, just, okay, well, tell me what your topic you want to do. And they tell me a topic. And I say, okay, well, I think you should do this and that. Good luck. And and write it. And then I'll, I'll see if I read it and I'll give you some edits. No, I like to really go step by step. Once that, you know, we do that, we, we, we create an outline. We talk about the, the general themes and what we're going to do. I work with them usually with a, with a list of, of very successful uh, sample students that I've personally worked with and that I develop uh, the essays with. Uh, and then I work with them on, okay, how can we build your essay? How can we, what, what are the elements that you have? We outline the essay and we work on it together. Uh, um, the first draft, generally the students do it on their own and then I leave comments and then we, we get together and we work on them. Generally they're you know, a series of drafts and where we're working together, it gets to the point where we sit down and we do the final edits together as a team. So I work with the students uh, personally, I work with the students uh, uh, in, in, in every stage of the process. So I think that's part of my philosophy. I think that if we wanna make an impact on the student, uh, we should be there for them in whatever they need. Some students, of course, uh, do far better when they have when they have someone who's a little bit more hands off, and I I I I am able to identify that and I work with that. Uh, the other thing that I really think it's important is for communication and collaboration to be present. So stakeholders should be aware of what's going on. Parents should know about you know what are the steps that we're taking with the student. I don't mind at all. In fact, I encourage for parents to sit down next to their students if they want to during our meetings. Uh, sometimes, of course, if it's a if the student is writing a personal statement and they think it's awkward to have their parents there, then it's maybe not a good idea to have parents there. But sometimes for strategy meetings and for all these other type of meetings, uh, it's it's important to 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 you know that the stakeholders, parents, and everyone else is involved in the process. And I think. Uh, Students are most successful when we all work as a team. Student, parent, counselor, uh, working together to me generally is, is a good re recipe for success. Uh, so that's a little bit of my philosophy. Um, here are some of like the general timeline of how things should look. I've just, I, I've talked about many of them for freshman year mostly. I meet students monthly. Uh, and we do a lot of like exploration, think about our courses, make suggestions about um, um, clubs, activities, summer programs, volunteer work, competitions, and I, it's basically the same for sophomore, but specializing a little bit more. Uh, and then junior year, we start meeting generally monthly um, and bi-monthly during the second semester. Sometimes if it's a very active second semester, uh, I can meet the students monthly as well if, if they're applying for a specific program and they need help with the essays. Uh, and so I, I make sure that everything that I said, uh, uh, I, I do it alongside with, with the students for junior and senior year. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think this was longer than I expected it to be, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it the floor for some, um, many of your questions that you may have. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, two QR code on the on the screen, uh, 你们可以扫两个二维码, uh, 你屏幕, 我, 我的, 我的是左边哈, 左边的这个二维码呢, 是, 呃, 
二维码，然后呢，您可以直接填一个表，然后呢，我们这边的小助手呢会和你进行跟进，来帮你安排和这个 Demi 老师的一次 free 的 inquiry meeting。呃，在这里提一下哈 ，Demi 老师他如果您是想要找 Demi 老师来做这个十二年级的这个呃升学的话呢，他现在的 capacity 的话呢也是比较有限了，所以的话呢，您可能要呃尽早的联系我们。呃，然后呢。屏幕的右边的话呢，你可以扫这个小助手的二维码 ，which is me。呃，您扫我之后呢，我可以把你加到我们的这一个升学的这个微信群里边。之后我们所有的和升学有关的一些资讯，包括讲座、讲座回放以及一些其他的一些信息哈，我们全都会放到这一个微信群里和我们的家长分享。好的，呃，这一个屏幕的话呢，我会现在留在这个 Q&A 的这一个整个过程里面，大家你可以扫码。呃，如果扫不了码的话呢，你在 chat box 里面可以看到，你可以加我的微信，或者是我们 IB Campus CEO Sophia 的微信，都 OK。呃，这个信息已经是我放到 chat box 里面了。OK， so let's， 呃， let's start the the QA。Okay, so first of all, we will address the questions about the ACT. So, uh, parents ask. So, since now it's like ACT optional, uh, is still you know how how they gonna deal with this type of policy change? Do they still have to take the ACT and submit it, or they can just you know uh, do not submit it? So, uh, statistics show that students that submit their SATs are far more likely to get into the colleges. So it, if you have a student with SAT that is competitive and that matches what the school is asking, I do recommend submitting it. If, if you're over what they're recommending, of course, submit it. So uh, I think the only chance, the only place when you are not, I wouldn't recommend submitting is that if you're below the the um, what the, the average SAT is for, for that particular school. Uh, but I will recommend, uh, I mean, the reality is that the SAT optional move is one that mostly benefits or particularly benefits students who are underrepresented minorities. I think it's, it's a great move for them because they're, they're allowed to, or they have the, the chance to uh, apply with no SATs when their SATs would be lower. For students, you know, if, if you have a, an East Asian student who's male applying for computer science without an SAT score, it's not going to go well. So the reality is that it's probably going to be very difficult for that student to, to do great uh, without the SAT. It does happen. It does happen that students who don't send SATs, no matter where they're from or what their background is, they, they do get accepted. And so I wouldn't say do not apply at all if you don't have a, an SAT that is competitive. But I do recommend, and I do think, I mean, the statistics show that you're far more likely to get into the school if you have the SAT that they're asking for, if you are in the ballpark of where, or where they want you to be. And if you're over, that's definitely a big advantage for you uh, um, for the SAT. So my recommendation is the SAT is still pretty important, obviously not for the schools that are test blind. So this doesn't apply for UC Berkeley or the UCs in general, um, Pitzer, and some other read and some other uh, 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 exceptions. There aren't that many schools that are test blind. Test blind means they don't care about your SATs. If you have a 1600 or a zero, they don't care. Uh, so for those schools, of course, it's not important, but for every other school that is test optional, uh, and it depends from school to school. So some schools are like, uh, we prefer students who have an SAT, and one that show, I think the position of UChicago is we really like students who have the SAT because it helps us understand more or less where they are academically. It's still a useful resource, but we don't require it. So a lot of the school's position is like, we are not requiring it. That means that your, your application is ready without an SAT, but the SAT will help them make a decision. And so uh, for, especially this is probably true for most top schools, the SAT is still pretty important. Um, and, and so I would recommend definitely taking SAT or ACT uh, for, for, for most students, yes. Okay, so the next question. So somebody asked if the ACT English 7, uh, 716, math uh, 790 are good enough for top 10 or even top five schools. Well, it's hard to tell. I think that the easiest way to, to look at it uh, is to look at the individual university that you're applying for look at their statistics, 
see where, where, where the, the 25 percentile is, see where the 75 percentile is, and then look at the rest of your application. If you have like a 4.0 and you you know walk on water, but you have a, 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 an SAT that it's not that impressive, but you have everything else that is absolutely outstanding, then that could be uh, good enough. But the reality is you really wanna be, for, for most students, and I think the, the rule of thumb should be, if you are around the 70, Fifth percentile that or even the 50 percentile you want to be there you want to be there uh, no matter what the school is you really want to be close to that you want to be surpassing that if possible because that you know those things are averaged out so you want to be as competitive as possible uh, and so it's it's yes uh it could be that you're good enough with those with those scores for certain schools for certain for certain programs uh, it also depends, you know, somebody is interested in engineering, computer science, uh, that's a different story than someone who's interested in sociology. Uh, SATs matter a lot more sometimes for students who are doing STEM. Uh, some APs matter more. So, so there are all these different things that you really have to look at individually to determine whether or not it makes sense or not. Um, and that's why it's really useful to have help from someone like a, like a consultant or a counselor that can guide you in those very specific cases. Okay, so uh, so for people who uh, take both ACT and ACT, so such as this question, so ACT is 15, 20, ACT is 35, uh, science 33, do you think they should uh, uh, submit both? If it's an overall 35, go with the 35. The 35 is, 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 is better. So I, I would probably use the 35. Um, both would not probably hurt much or at all. Uh, but I think the 35 would be what they end up really looking at and saying, okay, well, this is great. So th th it's hard to know whether a school has a preference for ACT or SAT. I mean, there are some rumors there that sometimes the SAT is better. And then there's some rumors that for other schools, the SAT, the ACT is better. The reality is that it's a very tricky, nebulous sort of like kind of thing. And when you speak to AL, sometimes they say, well, they're the same. Or sometimes they say, well, I personally prefer one over the other, but generally they tend to be personal preferences and, and, and they don't represent um, um, the general uh, of, consensus of, of admissions offices and throughout the country. So uh, there's no problem. I think a 35 looks great. A 35 would be something that it's very competitive for any school. Mm, okay, so let's give one question to 11th grader. Uh, PSAT. So uh, if somebody score a very high uh, score in PSAT, does it increase the chance to get into top school or it just for semi-final or final scholarship? generally for scholarships. So that will be great for scholarships for you. And it's a good precedent. I think uh, there, there's a nice correlation between high PSAT scores and high SAT scores. So it's, a, it's, it's great to be in, on a roll so you can carry that on to the SATs and eventually uh, uh, do great on the SAT. So if you're scoring really high PSAT, congrats. It will help you with, with scholarships. It might not help you at all for for university, but it's a good precedent for you. And you will, you, hopefully that translates into an SAT score. Okay. Okay, so now it's, uh, let's talk about AP. So it's a lot of questions regarding AP. Uh, how should you choose what AP classes to take? It's recommended to take as many as possible? Yeah, that's a tricky question. It, it, yes and no. So uh, you, wanna, you wanna be mindful of the SAT courses that you're taking. Uh, so let's say if it's a student who's very invested in STEM and who will be applying as an engineering major or any, any, any major in, in the school of engineering or maybe biochem or something of that nature, then you want to make sure that you're taking your STEM APs, but you also want to make sure that you're taking other APs to show well-roundedness, to show that you're, you know, capable academically in general. So my recommendation is take as many APs as you can handle to get A's from. I mean, that that should be, and making sure the, the rigorous, how rigorous your course load is matters quite a bit. And so if you're taking six APs uh, and you're doing well in all of them and you're able to take get fives in all of them, then I mean, why not? Take them all. Uh, but also if that's gonna affect your, uh, your uh your gpa uh then then don't make sure you are not doing that but it, i mean it, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty difficult 
thing to to determine if you don't know how the how the the scheduling is going to affect you. One thing that I recommend is for students to jump in and do um, start taking a, a very rigorous course load. And if, and if they have like a chance to drop a class and maybe take another one, sometimes that's recommended. But sometimes, I mean, one thing that I found out with some of my students is that they're, yeah, I can handle it. I can do, I can do those six APs. And then by the time, you know, midterms come, they're like, oh no, I couldn't do it. So, you know, it, it, it sometimes takes uh, a lot of maturity and understanding and judgment to make sure that you're making those right calls. But generally speaking, of course, if you can handle more APs, well, that's great. Uh, and and, and it's, of course, it's going to help you a bit. But uh, again, GPA should be king. Mm, OK, so this is another question, actually. So regarding the GPA and the, like how many APs you are uh, you going to take, I heard mm -hmm. about uh, today some parents uh, uh, asked me this question. So he she knows like some uh, some kids from his her son's school, they just take AP class but they do not take ap exams so because in that way they can bump up the gpa so mm -hmm. will this type of action you know uh, you know any you know will affect it, uh, how ao look at your portfolio no no I, it, it's good of course Sometimes a student may determine I can handle the six APs, but I cannot handle the six AP exams. That's fair. You don't have to take all six AP exams or you don't have to study for all six of them. Maybe you take all six, but you study for three and you get three, three fives and then three threes. And then you decide that you just don't submit the threes and that's it. You submit the three fives and uh, there, there's, there's no problem with that. I think uh, students can definitely do that. Uh, the AOs will see that those three exams were not taken uh, or they just got the other scores, but it's not going to be like, oh, this is really bad. This is no, the, 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 the rigor of the courses is one thing. And then the AP exam is another thing. Okay. So which lead to another question. So will the top, uh, top Ivy League university uh, recalculate GPA based on the, the rigor standard, like the, the class rigor, like how they do this? Yes. Yes. So, uh, they will generally look at the unweighted GPA, but all the schools, not only the Ivy Leagues, all the top 30s, they are mindful of the class rigor. So if somebody has a 4.0 with 12 APs versus somebody has a 4.0 with one AP, they know that. They know what it means to have a 4.0 with 12 APs versus having a 4.0 with, with one AP. Uh, so it, they, they are not ignoring that. They know it, it's, it's a bad idea to say, okay, well, I, I wanna have a 4.0. I'm not gonna take any hard courses and I'm gonna have a 4.0. That 4.0, it's not the same 4.0 as that other person who has all the APs, especially if that class offers APs. So you're gonna be, uh, students are judged a lot based on what the, the reality of their school is. So if your school offers six APs and you're taking all six APs, that is very good. It, that's what you could do in your school. If you're able to take APs outside your school, well, then that, that shows great initiative. And you took the six APs that your school offered plus three others that you did on the, over the summer and you made an effort to do that. That may be helpful, maybe a little bit. And so uh, those things help. Uh, uh, so just making sure that you take the most rigorous course load that you can at your school and that you're being uh, mindful of why you're choosing the classes that you're choosing. Sometimes, you know, it could be that a student has the option of taking uh, AP psychology, which is regarded as, or a, let's, let's put it clear, AP environmental science, which tends to be a, considered a very easy AP versus maybe an AP uh, statistics or, or computer science, not principles, uh, but a, an, an AP that can be regarded as difficult. And then the student chose AP, Sometimes there the, the class rigor matters, but let's say your teacher says, oh, the reason why he took the AP environmental science classes because, or the, or the counselor rather says, oh, the student had the opportunity to take a very difficult AP, but they chose the AP environmental science because that contributes well to the, to the field of study that they like. They're really interested in environmental science and they wanna apply technology with environmental science. Then it makes sense. Then the class rigor sometimes sometimes narrative can 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 have value over rigor. It depends on on, on the situation again and what your specific reality is. Mm. 
Okay, cool. So, uh, and another question is, uh, if the okay, if somebody you know some students they will go outside of the class, like go to the local community college to take the AP course, but uh, at the same time, the, the school also uh, provides AP courses. In that scenario, like, should should they choose the community college uh, AP course, which might uh, much more easier to get five, or they should stay in school to take the AP class from the school? So community colleges would not offer APs. They would offer like a double enrollment type. Oh, of yeah, sorry. Yeah, program. yeah, double enrollment, yeah. So uh, generally, APs are easier for admissions officers to 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 look at. They they think it's 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 much clearer what the what the um, expectation of those courses should be. Uh, when there's no option, and you want to do double enrollment, it's okay to do it, but not not replacing APs. It's not a good idea to replace APs with double enrollment. It's okay to have double enrollment, but I would place APs as a higher priority. Mm, okay, cool. So and okay. More AP questions. If uh, AP score, exam score is not very good, can students ask the school board, uh, college board, not to send the, no, the, the, the result to the college? For sure. So if you have a two, don't send it. <laughs> don't just don't send it anywhere. Uh, so bad scores are not sent. Uh, I mean, they sometimes the colleges will say, send everything, we, we understand, just don't send it. Don't, <laughs> low scores, don't send it. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, and is AP foreign language a must for a good chance to get into a top school? Because I guess a, a lot of like Chinese students, they probably will take the AP Chinese. It's good. I mean, I think the, the what what the AP Chinese uh, course does a lot, it legitimizes their claim to being native speakers. I know it's very easy to say, well, I speak Chinese great. And then just trust me. And well, I mean, I mean it, it's hard for them to trust. If they see like an AP score for the AP Chinese and they 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 know for sure you are capable in Chinese. And the languages are good. Uh, they, they help uh, if you have, you know, of course it's way more impressive if you have a Chinese student who's doing AP Spanish or AP, you know, that's better, of course. Uh, but at the same time, it, it helps. I, I, I if, if you have the possibility and it wouldn't be too hard to do the AP Spanish test, I recommend doing it if it's not going to be if it's not going to be something hard. Mm. Okay. Uh, next question. I heard getting a B in an AP course is better than an A in a regular class for the same subject. Is that true? It depends on the class. It depends on the on what you want to study, uh, and it depends on the rigor of the circumstances as well. Let's say. One thing that I noticed, I had a student who who had a B in AP Physics, and the student wanted to study physics, and uh, her recommender was her physics teacher, and the physics teacher explained that everybody in the class, nobody got an A, and that was the hardest working student they've ever had. And in that case, so, th so there are many scenarios in which like a B can be better than an A, uh, it, but it's a, it's a tough situation. Like I, I think if the student is showing a lot of rigor, and almost all of their classes are A's and almost all are AP's and then you have a, a B there that it's not an AP. I think that might be better than if that class were an A. Uh, but it's very situational. It will really depend on the AO. It would really depend on the, on the uh, committee. Uh, it, it's a difficult question to answer, I feel. But uh, generally speaking, I think uh, trying to go for A's, if it's gonna be you know, a course where you can guarantee a 4.0, I, I would normally, recommend that, but if it's a specifically hard course, like it's a very difficult AP physics class, uh, which I, I keep saying AP physics is very difficult. It was personally the hardest AP I ever took. That's why I use that as, as an example, but it could be any any AP that is difficult for like like for, for students. Uh, so it, it could be uh, any course that that appears to be very difficult for, for most students. And then if there's a B, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Mm. Okay, so actually, uh, I, I think the next question will be the last question for the AP category. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my son has 14 APs, including eight, five, and mm -hmm. four fours. Mm -hmm. Unweighted GPA is 3.85, weighted is 4.71. Also, ACT is 
1940, mm -hmm. and with two summer research, how much, uh, what's the chance he could get into CMU or Northwestern University? I guess CMU should be like, you should, you want to ask is, is a computer science or engineering uh, major, right? So actually we got this type of question a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Try to ask you like, oh, what's the chance they could get into certain specific schools? Yeah, yeah. Ch chance me questions are difficult because it, it's really hard to tell. I mean, I, I would like to see the research for those summers and I would like to see uh, what other extracurriculars we have. We have to see the quality of those essays being written. Numbers wise, it sounds like GPA wise, it's good. GPA wise, we're around there. Uh, SAT, SAT wise, it's good for CMU, especially for Northwestern, maybe a little bit low. Uh, uh, but I mean, it's... It, I wouldn't say don't apply to them for sure. They would be reach schools. I think both of them would be reach. CMU a much more uh, attainable reach. I think if the student has the chance to break the 1550s, it would look good on their SATs. So if they can break the 1550s, if, like without doing too much work, like maybe if they're scoring 1570 in, in, in their practice test, it would be a good idea to maybe retake that SAT to break the 1550s. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we will have to look at the extracurriculars and, and the narrative and the writing and all these different things. But I think ballpark that student would be around where you want to be, uh, maybe a little bit low for, for Northwestern, maybe pretty good for CMU. But CMU, especially if it's computer science, it's pretty hard to. So, so it would depend on the specific major. If we're talking computer science for Carnegie Mellon, it's going to be hard to. We would have to really see... Uh, uh, the, the research and if it were is the research oriented, some leadership and all these different things. But I think that student, you know, if I work with that student in their list, I would say, sure, you can have CMU and Northwestern in, in, in that list for sure. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay. Now we're talking about the GPA. Uh, how to find out uh, what's a GPA, of course, the SAT score for specific major such as CS? A school mm. requires to, you know, so 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 basically they they not they just they want to find out the the rose uh, sports for specific majors, not just for schools. So where they can go to find rose data. For specific majors, it's generally hard to find. I think for some, it's relatively easier to find. Like if you're looking specifically for computer science, there's generally going to be data, Googleable data. Like you can Google uh, GPA for uh, computer science at X school, and generally you will get some data. So it, it's, but if you look GPA for history majors at X school, you're likely not going to get it. So it depends on the major too, and, and which where people care the most or are looking about what GPA people have to get into X uh, major uh, or, or planning to get into X major. But I think most of that information is Googleable, and if it's not, that means that there's no record of it uh, from from uh, uh, the school. Sometimes, I mean, it's a long shot, and generally you're not going to get this information. But you can send out an email to the 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 admissions office at the school and say, "Hey, I'm really interested in this university. I really like this major. Do you have the data of the average GPA of admitted student for?" In electrical engineering. I don't know. Whatever, whatever major that, and I mean, the response can be, we don't have the type of data, or they might say, oh, yes, well, we don't have that specific data, but we have this data, or yes, here's the data. So uh, Googling, reaching out is probably the best way to find four specific schools. Uh, um, <clears throat> yes. Okay. So, okay. Another question. So uh, how to find out like uh, how many uh, IV or specific schools are the missions? from their own high school had in the past a couple of years? I guess, oh. would you ask a counselor? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Yeah, so establishing the connection between your high school and that particular university, that's very important, in fact. And it should be a thing to consider when you're working on your college list. So that's a great question. Uh, the best way to do it is making sure that you have a great relationship with your counselor and they might have the data. So your college counselor or academic counselor will know historically how many students from your institution have gone into what school. Uh, and so, so there are clearly some established connections between X uh, high school and X university that 
your school might be considered a feeder school for that university and you might not know about it. So it's a great idea to, when you're you know, defining what your college list is gonna look like to ask your college counselor, does this school feed any universities? Are we, you know, do we have some kind of established relationship between our institution and some other uh, university? So college counselor will be your best bet mm. or okay. academic counselor. Okay, cool. So, okay, let's jump to the recommendation letters. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we especially mentioned that you better find uh, the, the teacher actually from your uh, junior year, right? So, and this one question like, uh, can he get, can he or she get the recommendation letter from 10th grade teacher? And so basically one of the, I guess, Okay, one of the teachers, uh, he's planning to get a recommendation letter actually mm -hmm. left the school. So basically, I guess uh, the second choice will be the 10th grade uh, teacher. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so it, it generally, it is preferable to have a junior uh, teacher, but if that sophomore teacher was particularly good and the letter, you know, it's gonna be also particularly good and the and the teacher also continues to be in touch with the student and they know what the student is engaging with and they can talk about their experience in the classroom, but also about their maturity post-classroom, then that's it's fine to have a, a, a sophomore a teacher. The, the rule of thumb is generally the uh, a junior teacher, uh, generally two junior teachers that tends to be what, what works best for students, but it's not unheard of to have successful applicants who have uh, sophomore teachers as well. The one that I would not recommend is a, is a freshman teacher. So freshman teachers, I would try to stay away from unless like there's absolutely no one else that you can ask for that. Or if you know that the 10th grade teacher that could potentially do it absolutely doesn't like the student, you know, in those radical situations and maybe, but it should be for the most part, uh, uh, junior teachers, Sophomore teacher can be okay if, if, if there are no other options or if there's a particularly good story there or some specific circumstance. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, next question. So uh, if this uh, kid's uh, trying to, you know, uh, maybe apply for STEM major, uh, can he, uh, you know, uh, okay. Can he get the recommendation letter, both recommendation letters actually from two STEM teachers? Or, you know, why should it be from a humanity teacher and another one should it from a STEM teacher? Great question. And the answer is it depends on the, on the student's narrative. So let's say if the student's overall application shows a great well-roundedness and you can tell that this student is really interested in STEM, but they also like to bridge, you know, their work with computer science, with their work with uh uh, sociology or anthropology or they are interested in other things and they also like you know arts and music and that's the general profile of their uh, activities and all these different things uh, uh, that they're doing and then you have your physics teacher and your and your chemistry teacher write the letter saying how this student is an amazing STEM student and he thinks uh, mathematically and everything that he does it's like amazingly uh, logical and, 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 and then you have a little bit of a discrepancy in narrative. You were creating a little bit of a fissure in between what the, what the teachers are representing and then what the student presented in their narrative. So there's a, there's a problem of continuity there. What you wanna have is continuity. For that particular student, it would be great if there's like, you know, the physics teacher, but also the, the AP literature teacher. That would look great. Or, uh, but if it's a student that is very STEM oriented and they did most of the, of the things uh, for STEM and that the letter of recommendation from the humanities teacher wouldn't be as impressive as those two from those STEM students, from those STEM teachers, then go for the two STEM teachers. So it, it really depends on, on, the, on the situation of the student, on the narrative of the student and the specific you know, um, activities that they've done and the, the, the profile of the student. Mm. Okay, so now let's talk, up, uh, let, let's talk about the early decision and early action strategy. So somebody actually asked about the rich, match, and the safety schools. Uh, the original question is, what are rich, match, and safety schools? But I guess I want to you know, paraphrase this question into how you benchmarking uh, mm -hmm. rich, match, and the safety schools, and normally how many like, total number of schools you should apply for. 
regarding nowadays the situation changed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it depends on where the process starts for the numbers. So for the numbers of how many schools you should be applying to, it depends on many things. It depends on the schools that you're choosing. It depends on uh, when you started. It depends on the whether you only want one specific field of study or many field of studies. If you're a student who's applying for business schools, but also economics, but also something else, and you want to have more schools so that, that those can be well represented, the very typical college list will have around sub 15. Uh, seven reaches, five matches, three safeties. That's the very typical. And then I recommend for those students generally to have five extra schools that they have like waiting for them. Uh, the majority of them can be like maybe three reaches and uh, two, two matches or four reaches and one match or whatever it is that they want to do with that. How do you determine which schools are reach and match and all that? Well, it depends on on, on the school, on, on the students' numbers, right? So this is all about numbers from the students. If it's a student with a 1600, a 4.0 uh, and amazing extracurriculars, well, basically anything that's top 20 will still be reach. <laughs> so even if you have perfect everything, almost everything in the top 20 will be reach for you anyway, because for those students, it takes much more than perfect numbers to get into those schools and the, we we deem them reach because it we you still don't have a 50 50 chance or like a or anything like that to get into those schools so that would be reach for those students even in that case so generally you want to see at the numbers if your gpa uh the very basic way of doing it if the gpa and the sat scores align with the average accepted student uh then that can be a close reach or um, a close reach or a match, if, if you're a little bit above the, the average acceptance student, then that's generally a match. Uh, the reasons why I say that, not exactly, if, if it's 100% match, why aren't, why aren't you a match? Well, the reason is because that averages out all the type of students that are applying. If you have underrepresented minorities, those numbers are changing a little bit, uh, uh, the, the numbers. So I'm, I'm assuming that the student that's applying is a, is, a, is a student that is not an underrepresented minority. And for that reason, you wanna be a little bit over what is average because for that demographic group, the number is gonna be a little bit different than, than, than for other demographic groups. So you don't wanna go for the average, you wanna go always a little bit higher. So you're, if, if you're a little, bit, a little bit higher for a match, you're a match. If you're a little bit lower for a match, it's a reach. So it's, that, that's the way you, you play that game. However, that's not the, it's more than that. You generally need the help of a, of a college counselor or a consultant to tell you, well, we have to look at your extracurriculars as well and all these different elements to see whether or not you, uh, what those schools will be for you. But generally what you should be knowing is the top, top schools are gonna be reach for everyone, far reach for most people. Uh, and, and then you, you base it on the, the, the GPA and, and, and SAT score of the student and in what the uh, school's averages are. Mm, okay, so yeah, so basically it's not really like just, you know, like a very simple question. We have to look at the overall profile mm -hmm. of, a, of a student. Okay, mm -hmm. so somebody asked like, can, uh, can they ED to both Wharton and UC Berkeley? There's no ED for UCs, so you don't ED UCs. You can ED for Wharton uh, and then apply for UC Berkeley. That is possible. Yeah. You can if you ED for, for Wharton, you can still apply to UC Berkeley. It's a it's a it's a public school and they are not mm. in the restricted, there's no restriction to apply to 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 UCs, even if you're EDing something or even if you're REA in anything. If you're doing like single choice elective, whatever it is that you're doing, you can still apply to UCs. Mm. Okay. So and uh, okay. Um so when will the financial aid be decided for ED uh, applicants? So can they just back out if it's not enough? So basically, they, if they said, okay, the, the financial aid you give to me is not enough, so I can just back out of the ED. I think that's the only way you could out of the ED, right? Mm -hmm. It's a tricky question. It's a hard one because, the, I mean, the answer would be yes, you can back out if you cannot pay for it. But if you said something in your application about financial aid and this is what I can pay for, and it made sense for you to, and, and they're meeting that 
expectation, but you say, well, actually, never mind. I cannot pay for it. You have to justify that. Like, why can't you pay for it now? Did something huge happen in your life to, to justify that? Uh, it's a risky game to play, but it is a game that is played for, for people who want to, you know, break out of uh, 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 an ED commitment. You have to be able to prove or show that you're not able to, to afford the school. And that's the really the only way that you can easily break from, from an ED commitment. Mm. But I mean, I guess like if you just like, you know, really get out of it, I, I guess maybe your high school will really hate you forever. Because you will might affect the, the next years. It might have so you you're 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 hurting the reputation of your college council or your counselor, you're hurting the reputation of your school, you're hurting your own reputation. If it sounds like a, I think you're kind of like lying about it and you're just saying that you cannot pay for it and you're gonna pay for it because you got some other acceptance or because you think you're gonna get some other acceptance. Um uh Yes, I wouldn't recommend doing that unless it is very real or unless it is like a very special case. I wouldn't recommend uh, unbinding yourself from, from an ED commitment. Uh, okay, the last question up, uh, in, this, in this category. Can you ED and RD the same school if you did not get in for the ED? Can you still uh, you know, apply the in RD round? Oh, you can you can get deferred yes so uh, there are deferrals from ed uh from um uh ed so so the school but that's determined by the school they can determine whether or not you are deferred to regular decision and you would be reconsidered as a normal applicant uh, yes mm. okay so okay now let's jump to the uh, athletic, uh, athletic recruitment okay so uh the first question my son has been playing ice hockey since six years old he's a good player and spent a lot of time on it but he might not be good enough to play college hockey uh, mm -hmm. uh division one or division three uh my question is uh if his commitment to hockey is still helpful in college application this question is so common. <laughs> it's a very common question. And it's it's a it's an important question because the general answer is yes, but be careful with it. So if if you know the student has a passion for hockey and they absolutely love hockey, that's what they love doing. Uh, I wouldn't say stop doing hockey because it's not good for college. <laughs> it's, it, it's I mean, it's a mean thing to do to, to somebody who's passionate about something. Uh, but I think it also can help with the narrative. So the application it's more than just numbers and that it's important to understand that you know he might have beautiful hockey essays and there might be a very amazing essay that will that will be developed by the student for hockey and and what it means for them or when they have okay tell me about an activity that you enjoy and then they can write this amazing hockey essay and then they can see oh well this student played hockey throughout their entire life it's amazing that we have a student that it has a passion for something like that and that might be a good a positive thing for for applications uh, however, you also have to be mindful that to be a very competitive student, you also need to do other things. So if that hockey is taking, you know, 20 hours a week and there's no room for research, there's no room for working a little bit more on extracurriculars or do other extracurriculars and doing other things, well, then the hockey then is probably hurting uh, uh, more than it's helping. So it's about balance, making sure that, you know, I wouldn't take away hockey from that student at all, but I would make sure that he the, the student has time to do other things uh to make sure that they're you know maximizing their opportunities hockey can be like a great uh uh activity that they have on their list and one that they really focus on but if it's draining all of their energy and all of their time and they're not getting recruited anywhere well that's not going to be worth it mm. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, okay. There's another question uh, regarding the sports recruitment. How hard to be recruited by IV, Ivy League schools through competitive swimming, uh, compared to mass competition or through doing some other things like a science science fair? I guess it's more like a compare apple with pear. Yes. Yeah. It, it's apple very with orange. <laughs> yeah. So competitive swimming is very competitive and, and students get recruited sometimes very early when they're really young and uh, swimming is a, it's a very special case. Uh, but it's one of those things, I mean, athletically and 
numbers wise, it's a lot harder to get recruited division one, almost anything that to get accepted into any university with your academics and your background, because there are very few students that are that athletic. You know, division one uh, 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 recruitment is for students who are clearly very talented in the sport and they are amazing athletes. Uh, and so it's, I mean, for, for swimming, which is a very competitive sport, if you have a student that is very athletic and they will get recruited by a top Ivy League school, uh, chances are that's harder than almost anything because it's one in so many students that are that athletic. Uh, but that's almost like, you know, thinking of division one recruitment, it's almost like thinking about like how easy it is for my student to to be drafted by the Lakers. You know, it's 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 a very difficult uh, a question there where it has almost nothing to do with academics. It has a lot to do with just athleticism. And so where we really, I think where most of the students will be is those students who are division three students that have academics, but also uh, are, are competitive enough to maybe play at a college level division three. That's where it gets more tricky uh, for the division ones. It's, it's absolute, you know, talent and dedication and passion from those students that are excelling at a level that is it, it's beyond just, you know, commitment. It's, it's talent and all these other things that are hard to measure with. Mm. Okay, so I guess the last question uh, in this category, so finger skating, I, I know a lot of like Asian students, they do the finger skating and fencing, right? So I guess, first of all, like how hard it is to be recruited as a, you know, a finger skater. And secondly, uh, I guess my question is, doing fencing, doing finger skating, will it also, you know, actually, you know, in general help the college application? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so same answer to the hockey question. So uh, if the student has no potential of being recruited, then of course, it's great that they're doing this extracurriculars. It's, it's amazing that they're uh, engaging in something that is physical. It's showing that they're more than just a robot that's great at math. It's showing that they have, you know, passions, loves, and that they participate. They have leadership and all these qualities for different things for the sport. Uh, and so a sport will not hurt, but the time commitment with that sport can hurt. So if you're spending, again, like 20 hours for, for one particular sport where you're not going to be recruited, that can potentially hurt a, a student that it's not going to do anything else. Uh, in terms of how difficult it is to be recruited for those two particular sports, fencing and, and figure skating, I'm not sure. I, I've never had a student uh, work with me for either of those two. Uh, but my, my guess is that it's, it's hard and that you probably are able to tell by the time they're like junior year whether or not they have potential to be recruited. Uh, if they're ranked highly, uh, if they are winning competitions, if you look at their profile and it looks like that other profile of that other student who got recruited, that's when you start to ask those questions, reach out to coaches and see what the chances are. But if you're in a position in which, okay, well, I'm not really sure. It doesn't seem like the student is yet at the level where they can be recruited. I'm going to spend 25 hours a week so that they can get there. It's a tricky game to play. It's a scary game to play. I don't know if it's worth the gamble. Uh, so I, I would be very careful. I think my suggestion for most students who are in that position and which is unclear whether or not they're going to be good for, for division three or not. Uh, if, if the question is whether it is division one or not, then they're likely going to have a shot at division uh, two or three, right? So uh, uh, that's a much easier question. But if they are between division three or not recruitment at all, then, um, then you have to really uh, be careful with, with would would be, you know, be be careful with with what the chances are, uh, but yeah, for those particular uh, um, uh, sports, I I have no, I mean that most of the students that I work with uh, get uh, uh, recruited is generally squash, uh, tennis, uh, um, I've had some soccer, uh, uh, but but figure skating, I think it, I don't think it's well represented in, in colleges, uh, uh, but I don't know what what the process would be for that, in in just by what based on what I know I think for figure skating it's going to be much more of a sport that it's going to contribute to the applications holistic uh, 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 view and adding more to the to the well-roundedness of the student much more than recruitment or anything of that nature mm, okay somebody some uh, some parents ask how about the ping pong table tennis uh, <laughs> I don't know either I mean it's, it's a great question I mean it, it's it's a very competitive sport but I don't I don't know. I, I haven't worked with students with ping pong, 
either. Right. I think it would be interesting to look at, at what the numbers are, what the divisions are for those particular sports and see where the student is in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and there and there you can determine maybe even quite easily with the Google search where, uh, uh, um, where they are in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of that sport. But yeah, it, it, it would depend. Uh, mm -hmm. So yes. Okay. Okay, cool. So I guess the last category, uh, we try to finish uh, at 11 p.m. Okay, because we we want Demi to take a rest. It's like too tired <laughs> for you for the for the past one week. Okay, <laughs> research, research, and you know, like a cornerstone uh, project. So uh, actually, nowadays everybody is doing this type of you know academic research cornerstone uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, how to actually stand out? Well, there are easy everybody ways. Stand out. Yeah. If, you know, if you have a company and the company is making a million dollars, you will stand out. So uh, there, there are easy ways to stand out and that's how successful your cornerstone project is. If you're you know, building a drone and your drone is being used by the, by the United Nations to do something, you're gonna stand out. So it, it, accomplishment is what stands out quite a lot. If it's research, what will stand out if, if it's published, if it's published at a, you know, an acclaimed journal, it will stand out. So whatever it is that can be sort of like uh, clearly an achievement that it's unusual, then all of that will definitely stand out. Uh, it will stand out much more than, you know, winning first place DECA or winning first place, whatever. Something that has that X factor nature will stand out quite a bit, uh, whether it is a company, an app, a research project, uh, uh, an essay that was published, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, if it if it gains some recognition at a national level, or if it's you know has some kind of recognition that it's obvious, uh, uh, then then that will definitely be like the goal for anyone with a with a passion project, a cornerstone project of that nature. Uh, so achievement is the way you you stand out. I mean, it doesn't mean that without achievement you don't stand out. Of course, if you if you have an NGO and your NGO is helping a lot of students, but maybe not in the hundreds of thousands, but it's helping a good, a good group of students and you, you, you know, frame it in a nice way and that it's clear that you're very, very passionate about it and you've, uh, you know, talked to your local mayor or things of that nature, then, oh, that, that looks great too. Uh, of course, the more, the higher the achievement, the, the more impact uh, the, that will be or the more impressive it can be uh, in your application. Uh, but yes, achievement is the easiest way to stand up. Recognition is the easiest way to stand, stand out from, from those um, cornerstone projects. Okay, so okay, the next question will be, so the deliverables of Rose Cornerstone project, and what's the goal of you know, this type of you know, research or project? Uh, I mean, I guess this question will be, I mean, if you can publish it, in a peer reviewed uh, uh, journal, that's that's would would be nice. But I guess most of the students they either do not have time or you know or energy to really spend on certain uh, on one project to make it really you know like stands out. So besides publication, like does other you know do other deliver deliverables also carry yeah. some weight? Yeah, it does. And so the the main thing, so cornerstone projects are not only useful when they reach a, a, that level of achievement. They're also useful even if they don't. And the reason why they're useful is because they make the student unique. DECA will not make a student unique because everybody does it. Debate is not gonna make a student unique because everybody does it. Even if you're ranked in the top 20, 30, you know, a lot of students are ranked in the, in, in the 20 and 30 and, and a lot of students have debate and other things. And so what, what the cornerstone projects do is that they show a clear initiative and commitment for something unique that the student had the the interest to pursue. So if it's a if if it's a project, an app that was developed to connect volunteers with uh, different sites in throughout you know the tropical world, and maybe you have some NGOs in Hawaii, and maybe some in Mexico, and maybe some in the Philippines that work with you, but you're not doing it at a grand scale, then the admissions officers and, and the schools will be, wow, okay, well, that's great because this student with what they know, with what they have, their knowledge of computer science and the knowledge of environmental science and their commitment to volunteer work and the commitment to the environment had the initiative to develop something really unique. That is a great idea. Perhaps it's not performing at the level that 
they would hope for and they have 100 volunteers per day, but they did the initiative, they did the work and it, it's, it makes the students stand out. If the students sometimes, you know, admissions officers can have, oh, that student who had that, that, that NGO, oh, the student who had that, if you're able to be recognizable by an, uh, by an admissions officer, reduced by some activity that you did that's really unique, it's a good thing you, they, they, if they know you. So it's great to have those things that set you apart, those X factor things that even though if they're not super amazing, but they're there will help quite a bit in your application. Uh, I think what I've seen so far that makes the most impact if they even if they don't have like a great achievement is the ones that show sort of like uh, uh, like the culmination of what the student's narrative is. So it combines, you know, the, the different activities that they've done and synthesize what this student is all about. And especially if they're making some kind of impact in society, if they're helping society in a certain way, those type of projects are generally like huge knots from, from, from schools. They like the type of initiative. They like the type of student. That drive is generally something that is well rewarded by, by schools. Okay. So next question. Oh, okay. A more APs or cornerstone project, if they no. have time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, balance. So it yes, the there it's a it's a tricky question. So if you're gonna have eighteen or nineteen as <laughs> APs versus one with the cornerstone project, well, go for the cornerstone project and do eighteen APs. If you're saying you know three APs or or twelve APs and cornerstone, well. Ugh. Maybe the APs, but try to do some kind of cornerstone, even if it's pretty, pretty surface. You know, uh, I would try to have both, but you can change the level of commitment adjusted to your reality. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, I would say the APs are very important. Uh, the APs are great because they're part of the, the class rigor. Class rigor enters into a higher category than what the cornerstone would generally be as a, as a filter. Uh, so the cornerstone project is a great way to set yourself apart. But if you're not taking any APs to do a great cornerstone project, that's a that's a dangerous game to play. Uh, I wouldn't play that game. So I would do the APs and then try to do a, a cornerstone project, but not, you know, don't sacrifice your GPA and your overall crest rigor radically to do a, a great cornerstone project. Okay. Oh, uh, I guess that last last two questions. Okay. Uh, how do you highlight the research project and the cornerstone project mm -hmm. in your common app besides just listed as one of the activities? Yeah, so so yes, you list it as one of your activities, sometimes as two. If it's something really big, you know, like if, if there's some an activity that has multiple awards and all these things, you can take two lines to make sure you emphasize the importance of, of those activities and, and you know, you, you're mindful of, okay, for this, I'm using all the like the great impact that I had. And then here I will talk about something else and you can take two lines sometimes. Beyond that, what's really, really important is using them strategically with your essays. You know, how you incorporate those cornerstone projects into your personal statement maybe, or maybe into your activity essay, or maybe into your Y major essay. It depends, it depends on the, on the student's activity. It depends on the, on the student's cornerstone project, but definitely a cornerstone project will be well represented in those essays. Uh, so in the essays and the overall narrative that you're projecting, that's where it's going to shine. Uh, okay, somebody asked, what is Cornerstone? It's a special program or institution? I well, guess it's a passion project. It's, it's just a term that we're using. Something that is sort of like that, that main project that you want to put forward at the end of your combination of, of high school to think of it like, a oh, this is like my thesis project. This is the end of what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do with my uh, high school years. Uh, and you spend two years developing a little company or two years developing an NGO or two years developing this research project or this two years developing a product. It can be many things. You know, we just call it the cornerstone project because it's, it's what, you know, what you're going to use to to drive some of your narrative. Uh, uh, but it can be really, I think the, the, the more broader term for this is a passion project. Yeah, I guess it's just a different way to call it. I mean, in Chinese, we call it if I directly translate it, it's well, uh, it, it called a background enhancement. So basically, mm -hmm. just like, like elevate your profile. Yeah. So it's just mm -hmm. a different way to call it. Okay. Uh, last question. 
that's literally the last question for tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're attend, uh, we attending pre-college programs or summer camps in that university, you know, you, you, you try to apply for, will increase the chance to get admitted? Uh, no, for the sole reason of attending the program, but potentially for the reason that you know the school better. So uh, if, you, if you go to a, a, a UPenn program and you spend you know, some time there and you get to know professors and you get to know students and you get to sleep at the dorms and eat the food and, and, and get to know uh, 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 the school really well and the campus really well, that might help you get into the school. The program itself, not, not really. Uh, the program might help you, you know, it might help you general because it, it was a very prestigious program uh, and it might help you a little bit. Those programs generally, unless they're highly, 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 highly selective, they don't help too much, but they have their benefits. Like I said, if you were exposed to the university and you get to learn more about the university, that's pretty helpful. Uh, students have told me time over and over, okay, well, I spent some time at UPenn. I, I learned a lot about UPenn and that really helped me, you know, with my application. Uh, sometimes that's also true with Law & Checks, which Law & Checks has been losing a lot of prestige over the past years. Uh, but one of the things with Law & Checks is if you went to the campus and if you spent some time there, that could also help you with MIT, not because of Law & Checks, but because you were there. Uh, so, so being in the location really is one of the biggest benefits as to like improving my chances of getting into there. If you're familiar with the school, if you know the school that helps you, uh, but the program itself, uh, it might give you the boost that it will give you for any other school, uh, if there's any boost to it. Mm. Oh yeah. So I guess like uh, some, uh, actually some parents think about if send their kids to Rose Progress, they, they will have a chance to meet faculty from the mm -hmm. school. So they, they probably think about the recommendation letter or, you know, or trying to build a connection. So they think that, that you know, that thing could potentially help. What do you think? So letters of recommendation would generally be discouraged unless it is, you know, like a, a very clear connection. If this professor really looked at your research and they were like, wow, I want to incorporate you into my team. And, you know, it has to be something very special in which you can have like an outsider write a letter of recommendation. Only then, uh, you can meet professors, maybe sometimes for those programs, the, 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 the people who are teaching are not really professors, they're sort of like guest lecturers or other people, uh, but you might find a professor on campus and, and, and you like were able to talk to them, that's a possibility, maybe you went to an office hour with a professor, I mean there might be different ways of, of meeting professors, but you're not maybe going to interact too much with them in a classroom, or maybe you will, it depends on the program, uh, but letters of recommendation and things of that nature, are very, very rare, very unique to very specific cases. Uh, if, if like you're thinking, well, okay, I'm gonna go to this program at Harvard because uh, I wanted my student to get a letter of recommendation from that professor, you shouldn't be thinking about that. That that's not a no, it's not it's not a, an effective way of thinking about those programs. Okay. Uh yeah, okay. My I guess this last question will be from myself, okay? So if somebody, you know, in their senior year and still, you know, uh, you know trying to do some cornerstone project because mm -hmm. they have nothing on their resume, is it, it too late? Kind of, but I mean, there, there, there are ways of doing it. Uh, I think sometimes if there's a specific activity that the student has been doing, a normal activity can be turned into a cornerstone project with the right, you know, with the right extra amount of energy put into it with the right spin. So let's say a student has been volunteering at X place, and then you can make a narrative well, what, volunteering with that place, I open my own little NGO that is connected to that place. And then you can make it as you started doing it before, and then it turned into your cornerstone project. They're like different little strategies that will, I mean, it really is, depends on the student and it will be, uh, 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 based on the student, the the most realistic answer is it is pretty late. Like, so if right now a, a student gets to me and tells me, okay, I'm ready for my cornerstone project, what should I do? Um, it's gonna be much more about, you know, how how crafty we get and how creative we get in, in making something that you already have into a cornerstone project or framing it as such, giving it that much light. Uh, uh, 
and that's that will be the main thing like it's really hard to start a, a huge research project now right <laughs> if, if, if you're a, a a senior or a rising senior okay uh i think that that's yeah that's pretty much uh, it is okay that's uh we, we're gonna call it call it a nice and we cannot just uh, keep going on and because <laughs> uh, we still have a lot of questions we we haven't, you know, addressed, but uh, but we will see. Maybe next time we will do another round of the QA webinar. Because I, yeah. I, I guess, you know, yeah, parents they have tons of questions. But I mean, if you want to talk with Demi or you know, uh, know more about Demi's uh, consulting service, uh, like I said, you can scan the QR code on the screen, or you can contact me or Sophia. Uh, who is the CEO of IB Compass? We will help you to arrange the meeting with Demi. But just remember, I think Demi, you have pretty limited capacity for 12th grade. So, yes, I'm, yeah. I'm almost I'm almost there in in in, in for for no room. So yeah, it, very limited now. Yeah. So I mean, if your kids uh, will be you know rising in 12th grade and still uh, thinking about you know getting the service from Demi, please contact us as quick as possible. Yeah, so I, I guess we only have like several spots available, and and so and but you know for the eleventh grade, tenth grade, uh, Demi still have some uh, capacity. Yeah, so just contact us, and we will arrange the meeting for you. Okay, so Demi, thank you so much. I will just you know leave this screen there for a little bit for people to scan QR code and add it to our WeChat groups. But thank you so much. Now you can have a you know a good rest. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone for joining. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, uh, QR code